Hey everyone, welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Matt Bonjovi, and I'm so excited to be joined today by Jeff Schessel. Jeff is an author, historian, and former speechwriter for President Bill Clinton. Jeff holds degrees in history from Oxford and Brown University, and is a frequent contributor to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the New Yorker News Desk. As an author, Jeff's books have received many accolades, and two of his past books were both selected as New York Times Notable Books of the Year. Jeff is here with us today to talk about his newest work, Mercury Rising, John Glenn, John Kennedy, and the New Battleground of the Cold War. It's a riveting history of the epic orbital flight of John Glenn that put America back into the space race. In the book, Jeff examines this historic moment, recreating the tension and excitement of a space race that captivated the world. Now, throughout our talk, you might have some great questions popping into your head, and when you do, please go ahead and add them to the YouTube chat on the right. We will have time shortly for Jeff to answer some of these, so be sure to get your questions in early. We will additionally be giving away books to anyone who has questions on the event, so definitely don't hold your questions back. Uh, but first, Jeff, thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the intro. Absolutely. So your book examines many facets of the Cold War and how the U.S. and Soviet ambitions for space kind of interweaved into this. Can we start by going back to the early days uh, under President Eisenhower in the early to mid-1950s? How is the U.S. approaching space and how did that differ from what the Soviet Union was doing at the time? Well, if you had to characterize the, the U.S. approach to space exploration in the late 1950s, mid-late 1950s, the time of Sputnik, which was the fall of 1957, it was anything but urgent. President Eisenhower had not put a high priority on the space program. It was mostly a matter among the military branches. The Air Force had its own space program. They were trying to develop space planes that could uh, engage in combat in space. The Army had its own program and the Navy had its own program. There were scientific eff efforts and there was a, a, a general effort on the part of a, a lot of these different elements to put a satellite into orbit, but there wasn't focus, there wasn't purpose, there wasn't urgency. Eisenhower generally thought it was all a waste of time. He didn't see the benefit of going into space, whether you were talking about a, a satellite that was there to uh, observe the uh, the, 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 the cloud cover from above, he thought that that was a sort of silly science experiment and he was watching scientists essentially line up uh, with their hands out to receive taxpayer dollars to, to build what he called gadgets or what was referred to at the time as man in space. The, the idea that we needed for some reason and he just couldn't fathom what that reason was to send human beings into space. To do what is what he asked. He was not in favor of space combat and so Barring that, what was the what was the point of it all? What could a human being observe that these gadgets couldn't observe if he allowed them to go? So Eisenhower really uh, failed to invest uh, significantly in the space program, and not just federal money, but also expertise. Uh, the scientific experts uh, were essentially funneled elsewhere. The engineering was focused on building missiles that could carry nuclear payloads, not carry human beings. Right. And then you mentioned 1957 Sputnik happens. Did that take the U.S. by surprise? How did how did they react to that? And did that change kind of the direction at all? Well, it's interesting. It was not a secret that the two superpowers were trying to build satellites to send into space. It was, in fact, 1957 was something called the International Geophysical Year. And there had been some discussion among scientists internationally that they were going to try to build satellites. So we were aware that the Soviets were trying to do this. And yet when they did it, when they succeeded in doing what no country, uh, no human beings had ever done before and put that satellite in orbit, it, it delivered a huge concussive shock here in the United States. And not just here, but around the, the free world. There was a, a sense of incredible alarm. Just, I think it was the fact of it, the fact of, of, a, of an object built by Soviet scientists circling the earth, passing over the United States. Uh, people thought they could see it from San Francisco. There was a, a sense of, of alarm. And not just because of the fact of the satellite, but what it suggested was to come. There was all sorts of uh, kind of lurid of fantasizing in the nation's press and, and elsewhere about what the Soviets were gonna do in space. And it wasn't about science. 
it was about military dominance. There was a sense, as Lyndon Johnson said at the time, and it was later echoed by JFK and others, that if the Soviets could control space, they could control the Earth. Right. And, and you mentioned JFK there. So shortly after this, a few years later in 1960, there's a presidential campaign going on between John Kennedy and, and Eisenhower's vice president, Richard Nixon. How was the Kennedy campaign thinking about space and what was their kind of rhetoric on the issue and how did they see it um, for America? Well, it's important to see Sputnik as, as the opening shot, literally, of, of the space race. But there were others that followed immediately after Sputnik. Just a month later, the Soviets, we, we don't pay as much attention to this in the histories, but the Soviets sent up something they called Sputnik 2. And Sputnik 2 was a lot bigger and heavier than Sputnik 1. In fact, it was so heavy that American scientists wondered whether the Soviets had invented some new source of energy, some new source of propulsion that could carry something that heavy into orbit around the Earth. Then they s sent the first animal into orbit, the, the dog, Laika. Then they sent a spacecraft to crash land into the moon and succeeded in doing that. Then they sent another one around the far side of the moon to take photographs. The far side had never been seen by human eyes and had never been approached by spacecraft. So it was one thing after another. And when Kennedy runs for president, as you said, in 1960, there is a sense of mounting doom, uh, not just about the dominance of space, but again, what it suggested about Soviet science, Soviet technology, and so forth. So Kennedy ran on space as a symbol, and he said that it was unacceptable and dangerous for the United States to be second in space because it would mean that in the eyes of the world, we would be second more broadly in science and technology, second in military power, and second in the larger struggle, the existential struggle between freedom and totalitarianism. So I wouldn't suggest that it was a big part of his platform, but he sure did mention it a lot. If you go back and look at Kennedy's campaign speeches in 1960, he makes a lot of references to space because he really understands the symbolic power. He was running, as he frequently put it, to get the country moving again. And there was no greater symbol of how we had fallen behind than the space race. Right. And then so Kennedy, spoiler alert, becomes president and he starts to set the direction for, for NASA, this, this pretty new organization. How did he go about doing that and how did he decide what direction to take? Well, uh, uh, lackadaisically and inattentively is probably <laughs> how I would describe it at first. Yeah. In fairness to Kennedy, he entered office at a time of, of an incredible and, and growing global challenge. Uh, there was uh, there were Cold War tensions that threatened to erupt into conventional or even nuclear war in Berlin. There was a struggle, a civil war in Laos that threatened to engulf all of Southeast Asia. There was Cuba, the fact that on our doorstep we had a communist uh, power and, a, and a, an agent, essentially, of the Soviet Union. And so Kennedy inherited all these problems and, of course, uh, growing uh, unrest over uh, the lack of uh, progress in civil rights across the country, particularly, of course, in the Jim Crow South. And he turned his attention to all of these things. But space took a backseat. He handed it to Lyndon Johnson, his vice president, because Johnson had emerged right after Sputnik as a real leader, as I mentioned before, on, on space. But it was not a pressing concern. And it was very difficult for Johnson or anyone to get Kennedy's attention when it came to space. Until April 1961, when the Soviets achieved another first, and this was really the big one. This was sending the first man into space, Yuri Gagarin. And once that had happened, again, even though like Sputnik, it was expected, the fact of it was terrifying to people. And it created a, a real sense of, I think it's not too much to call it panic in the White House, that something had to be done. And immediately, even though there was no chance of catching up to the Soviet Union, in the near term. The question was whether we could identify a long-term goal that gave us an opportunity, enough running room to try to leapfrog the Soviets by the end of the decade. That is where the moonshot proposal comes from. Right, and and you mentioned that when uh, the Soviets put Yuri Gagarin into space, that it was somewhat expected. Do you mean by the US government or did the American people also kind of had this expectation that, okay, the Soviets are gonna do this and, and we're not? By both, there was uh, certainly a, an awareness that we were in a race that we didn't know very much about their space program. It was incredibly secretive and being a totalitarian state allowed them to, to not only develop their plans in secret, but to fail in secret. So when something went horribly wrong, as it did in the Soviet space program, when a, a missile blew up on the launch pad and killed more than 100 people, we knew nothing about it. 
when we didn't even know where the launch pad was. There was a lot of mystery about where these rockets were, were lifting off from because of course the satellite technology was not well developed enough for us to, to know. When one of their cosmonauts was killed in a, in a fire and training accident, we knew nothing about it, in fact, for, for decades. And so there was a sense of, of the Soviet uh, program as a, as a juggernaut, as invincible. At the same time, we had Project Mercury. We had our astronauts. There was a sense that we were making some progress and maybe, just maybe, we were gonna beat the Soviets into space. Uh, a, a, an American was going to beat the Russians into space. So there was some hope, even though by this point, for all the reasons I've described, there was a general sense that the Soviets were winning the space race and were likely to keep on winning. And yet again, the fact of it, just being aware that a Soviet cosmonaut was orbiting the Earth and passing over the United States before returning safely uh, to the Soviet Union was, was absolutely terrifying and had huge political and geopolitical repercussions. Yeah. So you mentioned that we had that the U.S. had its own astronaut program and the NASA and the U.S. government went out in search of, of men with the right stuff. They narrowed it down to the Mercury 7. Six of those men were relatively unknown at the time, but the seventh, John Glenn, had kind of made a name for himself already. What was the early relationship like between these seven men and how did Glenn's early fame kind of factor into that relationship? You're right. John Glenn was the only one of the Mercury 7 who was famous before he became an astronaut. He was, first of all, the most decorated combat pilot of all of the Mercury 7. Not even all of them had actually fought in combat. They were all military test pilots, but not all of them had been fighter pilots. And Glenn had fought with distinction both in World War II and in Korea. But he became famous in 1957 as a test pilot. He set a, a transcontinental speed record flying from Los Angeles to Brooklyn in three hours and 23 minutes, which was a big deal. It was a, a, a harbinger of new and more advanced military technology. And he wound up in his uh, brilliant Marine pilot's uniform. He wound up on the front page of every newspaper in the United States. Uh, and other pictures of Glenn and his attractive family, his wife, his two kids. And he, he was he, he appeared to be uh, exactly what, what the nation wanted to, what, Middle America, um, and not just Middle America, wanted to see uh, in its future leaders. He 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 represented uh, an American archetype, and so he was much celebrated. He was he was lauded in speeches in Congress. He was invited to participate in a uh, to be a contestant on Name That Tune, a CBS game show in prime time, and he was on it week after week, winning and really charming the country. So two years later, fast forward to 1959, when the astronauts are first introduced to the, to the public, the press turned immediately to Glenn as the one that they knew. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't simply that he was familiar. It was that Glenn, unlike the others, was perfectly at ease in front of the cameras. The cameras. If you watch uh, on YouTube, you can, you can see this actually, uh, the press conference when the astronauts are introduced. And Glenn is gesturing, he's performing, he's telling stories, he's talking about his family, he's talking about his faith, he's patriotic, he's a little corny, he's <laughs> funny. And the rest of them sit generally kind of wisecracking a little bit, but mostly stone-faced. And they are, as they all expressed later, they were extremely uncomfortable with the dynamic in that room and the sense that this was supposed to be a competition about who's the best pilot who will get to fly first to space. But if this is about being the best performer in front of the cameras, then they all felt like they were going to be at a disadvantage uh, compared to Glenn. And so the resentment that you mentioned begins to build immediately during that very first conference, press conference, and it, and it doesn't go away, it only intensifies. Right, and was that something going into that press conference that the other six had any sense that, that they would uh, be in this contest where it's, you have to kind of be able to charm the public as well, or were they kind of thrown in the deep end on that? They were thrown in the deep end. They were not prepared by NASA at all for, for what they were about to face. I mean, they knew it was a big deal. They'd gotten selected as astronauts. They understood uh, that there was a lot of national and in fact, global interest in this program and that there was gonna be a lot of attention paid, but they didn't have the experience to really know what that was going to be like. And walking into that room with the, 
the lights and the cameramen literally climbing over one another <laughs> to get closer to the stage. They, they were celebrities all of a sudden. And only Glenn knew what that was like. And only Glenn temperamentally was well suited to that role. So they understood they, they were gonna have to give press conferences from time to time, but they didn't think that they were going to have to become effectively movie stars or politicians or however else they described John Glenn. And, um, and they didn't like it. That wasn't the, the role that they wanted to play. Right, and, and Glenn was also a bit of an outcast in terms of, as you mentioned, he was kind of a, a man of faith and, and someone who took his responsibility as an astronaut icon very seriously. And then your book outlines the story of Alan Shepard going to Tijuana for some sort of less than family friendly reasons, uh, which ultimately leads to this potential PR crisis that, that John Glenn gets involved in. Can you tell us about that story and how it captures the complexity of that, that Glenn Shepard relationship? That's right. Well, Glenn had um, Glenn also understood something else about the role of astronaut, which was, and it seems obvious to us in retrospect, but uh, that they were going to be role models to the nation's children. And these guys were all very successful fighter or test pilots, and that's why they were selected. They were used to being the best at what they did, but none of them had really received much attention for it. Suddenly now they were on the cover of Life magazine and there were editorials praising them um, like they were new gods, really. I mean, that's not putting it too strongly. And so Glenn, uh, having a, a fairly strict moral code, uh, would lecture them a little bit and say, look, you know, I, I know you guys enjoy what you call extracurricular activities late at night in Cocoa Beach and wherever else we are. But um, as he put it, you got to keep your pants up because if something happens and, uh, you know, there's an embarrassment uh, uh, that, that comes of it and winds up in the press, it's going to be an embarrassment, not just to you and your family, but to the entire nation, to the program and the America in front of the eyes of the world. So, control yourselves. Well, there was really only one other astronaut, Scott Carpenter, who was close to Glenn, who was at all sympathetic to that line of argument. <laughs> and you mentioned um, what happened in, in San Diego. This was in September of 59. They were on a, a junket there meeting local officials and going to the factory where the Atlas rocket, uh, the orbital rocket was being built. And late one night, uh, Alan Shepard went over the border into Tijuana with a woman who was not his wife. And he was followed by a photographer and a reporter who recorded what they saw. And they were prepared to, to go to print with it the next day. And word uh, found its way to, to Glenn, who late at night picked up the phone, got a hold of the reporter, talked to the editor of the newspaper, talked to the publisher of the newspaper, and gave them all the same patriotic speech. He said, listen, we're in a struggle, as he put it, with the godless communists, and we're losing. And if you run a story like this, it will be another setback for the United States. So I understand you've got a great scoop, but is it worth it? And they decided that it wasn't, and they pulled the story. They didn't run it. And this might have actually raised Glenn standing with the other astronauts, except that he then overplayed his hand. And the next morning, he summoned them all to a hotel room there in San Diego, and he gave them a, a fierce lecture. And he said, this is what I've been warning you about. And if it hadn't been for me, then we'd be in big trouble. So do you finally see what I've been talking about? And of course, the response of these guys, and keep in mind, this is 1959. This is not a particularly enlightened time uh, culturally um, when it comes to, to women and marriage vows and, and the rest of it. And um, they said, essentially, to hell with you. Um, we've <laughs> and, they, and it was clear that there was no lesson learned here, except that John Glenn was even more of a moralist, uh, as they saw it, than, than they'd even thought previously. And of course, the press is important in, in crafting this narrative. And you mentioned that when the astronauts were first presented to the press, they, quite, they took to Glenn quite quickly. Did they have a sense that this was, that there was a competition among these seven men to be the first? And how did they kind of cover that, that narrative? That's in the coverage literally from day one. Um, there was a headline I quote in the book, it's something like seven vie for the chance to be first. Right. Uh, this was not a, a squadron that was going to go out on a mission together. They had won an incredible competition to get to be astronauts. And now everybody understood that they were competing with one another to be the first, hopefully the first man in space. But if the Russians got there first, then he'd be the first American at the very least. And so anytime they went before the, the press, the press would ask them, 
whether they wanted to be first. And essentially they all said, of course, of course we want to be first. If, if I wasn't the kind of guy uh, who wanted to be first, I have no right to be in this program. And so there was a, a lot of that play, played out in the press. And, and it, it was absolutely the case. I mean, none of them, they all knew that the, the others were great pilots, but they all kind of thought, I'm the best. Right. Um, at the same time, it was clear to the group, just in there was a group dynamic. These were not just seven individuals, that really the strongest personalities, the two who were most willing to speak their minds and seem to kind of rise above the rest were, were John Glenn and Alan Shepard. Yeah. So as NASA is preparing to make this, this first mission in this first manned mission into space, the seven astronauts were asked to provide in an anonymous ballot, basically their pick for, for the top three. And of course they couldn't choose themselves. They uh, assumed that that would be their choice. How did that go down with everyone? And particularly Glenn, the, the, the man who had kind of been outcast a little bit. Well, there's a lot of mystery in a, and there's still mystery about the peer vote um, because the only person who knew how much that peer vote, as they called it, counted was Robert Gilruth, the head of the whole operation, the head of the space task group. He was taking input from a lot of different directions. All of those who had been involved for almost two years at that point in the astronauts training, we're, we're now at the end of 1960, early 1961. Uh, were providing feedback about how the astronauts had been performing in the simulator and all the other many, many tests, water egress, land egress, the desert training. There were all kinds of crazy, very intense and dangerous uh, training. Um, uh, and they were being observed through all of it to see how they performed. So all of this was feeding into the decision-making process. But as you said, Matt, they also asked the astronauts to vote for the top three other than them themselves. And this went into the mix, maybe, or maybe Gilruth was just curious to see who the astronauts thought was the best. It's unclear. Um, but Glenn, when the decision was, was announced by Gilruth, he called them all into his office just right before John Kennedy's inaugural address. And without any fanfare or any explanation, he said, first is Shepard. Glenn, you'll be the backup. Second will be Gus Grissom. Glenn, you're going to be the backup to that as well. Thanks very much, gentlemen. End of meeting. <laughs> Right. Just like that. And Glenn went sort of storming off. He was stunned. He was stunned um, because he really did expect to, to be first. And in fact, it wasn't just Glenn who expected Glenn to be first. Many in NASA expected him to be first. And certainly the press and the public saw him as the, the greatest of, of, all, of, of all of the astronauts. So it was a huge shock to the system. And Glenn had a culprit uh, in mind. And it was this peer vote. And he felt that he was being punished for telling them to keep their pants set, as I mentioned before. And so he wrote a, a very angry uh, a letter, probably ill-conceived letter to Robert Gilruth protesting the decision. And he said, I am being punished for trying to protect the program. And I urge you to reconsider. Gilruth never even responded to the letter. <laughs> So this was a really tough moment. It was probably, uh, in many ways, the toughest moment in Glenn's charmed life. It was the biggest setback he'd ever had. Right. Yeah. And how did he go about? Because the astronauts knew that Glenn was not going to be first a, a bit before it was announced, before the public knew. So there was this period where Glenn basically had to be going out in front of the press, essentially pretending that he was still in the running. How did he handle that pressure and how, how did he handle that pain? NASA was weirdly and I think hilariously cagey about this whole thing. <laughs> Rather than to announce to the public that they'd pick the guy and it was Al Shepard, they, they were worried that there would be such a, an incredible whirlwind of attention around the choice against the chosen one that it would make it impossible for him to concentrate. So they, they, they announced instead, we have three finalists. And the three finalists are Shepard, Grissom, and John Glenn. And so the, the press immediately turned its focus to the three finalists when the competition was actually, in fact, already over. And they were supposed to pretend now, these astronauts, that this was the way it was, it was playing out. And the press just assumed, well, there are three finalists. Glenn, of course, is one of them. Glenn, of course, will be the choice. But Glenn himself knew that he, uh, he was the only one out of the three of them who didn't have a flight assignment. He was the backup, as I said, to, to both. So this was a really difficult period for him because he had to, he, number one, he, he lost the competition. That was hard enough. Number two, 
he had to be their backup, which meant that he had to essentially trail them. He had to answer their phone messages. He had to make sure they got everything they needed. He also had to be ready in case one of them broke a finger or whatever, or got a cold and couldn't go on his flight, then Glenn would get to go. So there was still a chance that he might fly, but it was kind of a humiliating business being the backup uh, to these guys when you thought you should have been the choice. And number three, he had to pretend to everybody in his life, except his, his wife, his parents, he had to pretend to his own parents that he was still in the running, that he was a finalist. So it, it was a it was a, a really difficult assignment, but he pulled it together. It was he had a, a rough few weeks. At one point, one of his best friends, uh, his best friend actually um, uh, from home, who lived near him in Arlington, pulled him aside and said, "You got to shake yourself out of this. You are miserable, and you're making everybody around you miserable. Your family. So get over it and get back into the program." That helped to. To, to change his mindset a little bit, um, but it was it was not easy. And is is there any indication or, or any clear indication of why Glenn was not chosen for that flight? There is no, you know, I, I spent four years on this paper trail, and right. um, if somebody else figures this out, my <laughs> hat will be off to them. Uh, it may be that the answer is somewhere in a box that hasn't yet been opened uh, in one of these NASA facilities. It may also be that any evidence of the decision-making process was shredded or was never put down on paper. Um, look, Alan Shepard was a phenomenal pilot, and there were certainly many in NASA who felt that on the basis of that alone, that Alan Shepard should be the choice. It wasn't as if Glenn ran, ran away with that competition. Um, you know, the two of them were, were essentially neck and neck. Grissom, not as much. Grissom was an excellent pilot and a serious uh, engineer, actually, uh, in, uh, among the astronauts. And yet nobody really thought that, that, that Grissom was, was in the lead. Um, or close to the lead, and so it, it's un, it's unclear. Again, Shepard was a was a, a, a crucial choice, but the resentment that we've been talking about directed at Glenn, um, having to do with his celebrity and also his willingness to speak out, to speak his mind, sometimes in a very prickly way. Um, actually, it ill suited him among the other astronauts, and it ill suited him with some of the officials at NASA, who didn't particularly. Uh, like those qualities of John Glenn. They wanted him to fall in line and to then be quiet. And he was not likely to do that. So there may be an element of just putting Glenn in his place. You're going to get your flight assignment someday down the line, but you don't get to go first. Now, that's just surmise on my part. I, I've got to be candid about it. I did not come yeah. up with a smoking gun document. Right. That makes sense. Um, so so Shepard is chosen for this flight and and the flight is successful. How important is it in terms of the narrative of the space race at the time? Well, it, it was important in that it got us over a small hurdle, but it's important to note that Yuri Gagarin didn't just go into space. Yuri Gagarin orbited the Earth. And Alan Shepard didn't get that chance because Alan Shepard was riding a rocket that wasn't powerful enough to send a man into orbit. He and Gus Grissom after him, they flew up on a, on a Redstone rocket. And the Redstone, as I said, just wasn't powerful enough. And so they flew suborbital flights. This is what Jeff Bezos is going to fly uh, in, uh, later, later this month. You go up, you come down. From start to finish, 15 minutes. That was the length of the flight. So even though Shepard's flight was celebrated and, and it was kind of a, a breakthrough and that we had finally gotten a human being into space, it felt like a distant second prize, not only because it happened second, but because it was not as impressive a feat as what the Soviets had already managed. Then, as I said, Grissom did the same thing in, in July of 1961. Shepard was in May, Grissom was in July. And there was a sense that, as, as one of the other astronauts, Deke Slayton put it, uh, all we could manage were these, these weenie flights. It was embarrassing, it was embarrassing. And so when Glenn was finally selected to go third, that too was supposed to be a suborbital flight. He was going to do another one of these, what NASA called short shots. And yet at that point, it had become such an embarrassment to the United States that the administration and NASA finally said, enough, enough with this. We have to accelerate the orbital program. And that means using a different rocket, a more dangerous rocket, and Glenn will be the first to ride it. And how did Glenn take that? Did he feel kind of that this is my bigger moment or was it was he still kind of not happy about being not the first American in space? It was an incredible stroke of luck for Glenn, frankly. Right. Uh, it was invested with so much more importance than I think anybody had anticipated. Again, because we were still behind and we were going to be seen as behind until we managed an orbital flight. And an orbital flight was 
not just a bigger deal sim symbolically, but it was a lot more complex in all sorts of ways that I could uh, take up the rest of our time talking about, uh, but I won't. Um, but it, it was a much more complex business. He was going to be in space for almost five hours to go around the earth three times. And there was a feeling that this would finally put America in the space race for real. And there was also a sense on the part of uh, the public, on the part of the press, on the part of Glenn's own friends. And I found lots of letters to Glenn from friends back home saying just this. They said, I understand now why NASA passed you over for the first two. They were saving you, John. They were saving you for the big one. This is the big one. Glenn didn't discourage them in the view, <laughs> but he, he knew that that had not been the case. Right. And in, in the build up to Glenn's flight, the there was a lot of anticipation about it across the nation. And, and even in the press was kind of actively worried that, that it was gonna be a disaster, that Glenn was gonna die. Um, what kind of kept NASA going on this uh, accelerated timeline that you mentioned? They really, there was so much pressure politically and geopolitically. There was just a sense of inevitability. This had to happen and there was going to be risk involved and they were doing everything they could do to wring every last bit of, of risk out of this, but they knew that that was not possible. And at a certain point, they were just gonna have to send them up there. Um, many in the program, many of the engineers wanted to send up more and more test flights. They wanted to send up more and more. They were sending up chimpanzees on these test flights and also some without uh, any, anybody uh, in the capsule at all. And uh, at, at one point, um, uh, Bob Gilruth, again, the head of the space task group said, we don't have that many chimpanzees <laughs> to do as many tests as you all want to do. At a certain point, we're just going to have to, to do this. Uh, Chris Kraft, who was the flight director, he ran mission control. He said on the eve of Glenn's flight, he said, if we thought about the odds at all, we wouldn't do this. We would never go to the launch pad. So there was a sense that it had to be done, but there was a sense as you described of incredible foreboding. Glenn's flight, when it ha before it happened in late February, 1962, had been scrubbed 10 times. 10 times over the course of four months. It was scrubbed because the booster rocket had been leaking fuel. It was scrubbed because there were problems in the capsule and the electronics. It was scrubbed because Glenn's spacesuit was leaking oxygen from the rings that attached his gloves. It was one problem after another. And the weather, by the way, was also causing a lot of these, these flights to be canceled because there were stormy seas, for example, where he was supposed to splash down. You couldn't have that. So the, those flights were scrubbed as well. So this went on for months and months and the press began to describe the word that was used often in the coverage was ordeal, the nation, the, the nation's ordeal. It wasn't just Glenn's ordeal, it was the nation's ordeal. You know, one of the reasons that I, I wrote this book was that I wanted to understand why Glenn's flight was so important. And I understood that he was the first American to orbit the earth, but it seemed bigger than that. And one of the reasons that it was bigger than that was because there was this incredible buildup of anxiety over many, many months where all people were left to do, whether they were uh, members of the public in the United States, whether they were uh, in parliament in, in Britain or whether they were NASA engineers, they had months and months to just sit and wait and worry that this could never go off successfully. So the buildup was tremendous and so was the anxiety. Yeah, and and talk about our drill. Can you tell us a bit about Annie, Glenn's wife? Uh, because your book highlights kind of the really incredible pressure that she was under at this time, especially in the run up to Glenn's flight. Annie is was an incredible rock of, of strength for, for, for John Glenn and vice versa. They had an incredible marriage, an incredible partnership. Uh, believe it or not, they met when they were two and three years old. They met uh -huh. in a playpen <laughs> because in their little town of New Concord, Ohio, uh, their families were friends. So they grew up together. Um, they were childhood, teenage sweethearts, and they got married after Pearl Harbor. And uh, I think being a, a military spouse or the, the, the wife of a test pilot in, in those days was, was terrifying uh, just on a regular basis. And so she lived with that. Um, but there was also another element to this, which is that Annie had a, a really severe stutter um, on the sort of gradient by which they, they measured these things. It was extremely severe. And so uh, Glenn seemed to be the only person uh, in her life other than her children who almost didn't even seem to, to notice it. Um, and uh, out in public, even in their little town, people would just walk away 
rather than stand there and, and let her try to finish her her sentence. Um, children would make fun of her. It was, you know, it was a very tough, tough existence. And so when Glenn was gone for long stretches, whether it was in combat in Korea or whether it was NASA training, it was tough, tough for Annie. So, um, uh, and she relied on friends and she, you know, when the kids got old enough, she relied on the kids as well. I mean, there's a wonderful uh, next chapter to the story that lies outside the realm of my book, which is that I think it was in her forties. She finally found um, uh, someone who had developed a kind of treatment that was incredibly effective and she was able, able to overcome it. And she became, and still is, even though she passed away last year at a hundred, um, she's a real source of inspiration for people who are struggling with, with speech difficulties. Yeah. And so going into the flight, was this something that she kind of understood was important for Glenn or did she not really want him to go? How did she uh, feel about it? I, I think she had a terrible ambivalence about it all. I mean, of course, she didn't want him to go. She thought it was um, terrifying in a way, even that being a test pilot wasn't terrifying. I mean, strapping someone to one of these uh, essentially untested rockets, untested in the sense that no human being had ever ridden one before, yeah. and doing it in front of the eyes of the world. It made the risks that she had lived with um, for so long much, m much more magnified and, and, and more, more terrifying. And yet she understood that this is who she married. This is who uh, Glenn was. And this was something that he really needed to do. And this was the way in which he wanted to serve his country. And uh, he was driven personally, but he, he also uh, felt that this, like military service, um, was a way of, of advancing America's interests in the world. And so she accepted it, but it was a struggle. And she spent a lot of time in conversation with the, the family uh, minister and, and, other and with family members um, to, to try to essentially hold herself together during this period. It was, it was very difficult. Yeah. So, so you mentioned that in the run up to Glenn's flight, it had been scrubbed 10 times. So going into the, the, the successful flight, what was the, the feeling around NASA and for Glenn kind of getting into the shuttle? Did he feel this is just another scrub? What was that like? Glenn was pretty sure it was just another scrub. I mean, he had um, he had gone to bed and woken up early in the morning and and gotten suited up a, a number of times by this point. So it all had felt sort of familiar. And uh, he woke up and the weather report wasn't great. And he thought, well, here's here's another scrub. So there was a sense of, in a way, emotional distance from what was happening because he was preparing himself to just circle back and and head back to to. Um, crew quarters in, in Cape Canaveral. Um, but at a certain point after he had been strapped into that, that, that capsule and sat atop the rocket for a while that the clouds began to open up and suddenly this was really happening. And for the very first time, even though he'd been through all of that before, the, the gantry that supported the rocket began to open up and sort of pull away. And he was standing alone essentially and the sun streaming through the window of the capsule and he knew he was going to go. And um, one of the last, uh, conversations that he had, certainly the last conversation with anyone who wasn't part of the operation was with Annie. And he was patched through um, by radio link to, to talk to Annie and the kids and to say goodbye. And one of the last things that he said to her was, did you get the recordings that I sent you? And I found, in fact, uh, and this was to me the most interesting and, and I think chilling thing that I found in the Glenn archives at Ohio State where he left his papers, a script that he wrote for himself for one of those recordings. He made a recording for his kids who were teenagers and a recording for Annie saying goodbye. Um, and these recordings would be played in the event that he didn't come back safely. And the script begins, if you hear this, I've been killed. And it's a very frank, a very personal, I mean, it was intended for their ears only. And it's, it's, um, uh, it's an incredibly moving thing to read. And this was the last thing that he asked her about. He was very aware you know, these pilots, they, they play it cool and they deal with mortal danger all the time. And that's part of the job description. But he was aware that he was facing risks that really no one had faced before. And um, he wanted to make sure that he had said everything that, that he, he would ever want to say. Yeah. And sticking with that theme of Glenn's awareness. So, so he goes up into this, into this flight and things are not necessarily going uh, smoothly after a little while. Um, can you tell us a bit about the heat shield problem and, and NASA's communication or, or lack thereof with, with that issue? 
Sure. Uh, so as I mentioned, Glenn was scheduled to orbit the Earth three times. And the first orbit went really well. Glenn was elated. He was having a great time. He was taking pictures with the special camera that he had brought along with him, and he was reporting in on everything. You could hear it in his voice. You can listen to these recordings. He was having a great time. But at the end of the first orbit, a couple things went wrong. And one was that the autopilot, which was supposed to run most of the flight, um, was malfunctioning. And, it, and the capsule was skating a little bit out of alignment, like a car with its wheels out of alignment. And the thrusters would automatically fire and knock it back into line. And then it would happen again. And it was wasting fuel. And so Glenn had to take over the capsule manually, which from his perspective wasn't the worst thing in the world. He was a pilot. They yeah. never liked the autopilot, the astronauts. It was a big struggle between the astronauts and the engineers over the autopilot. Uh, the engineers loved it, the astronauts hated it. So here he was flying the capsule. But something else was going on, and this is what you mentioned. Down at Mercury Control in Cape Canaveral, a warning light went on one of those blinky consoles that we've all seen in the movies. And it said that his heat shield had started to separate from the capsule a little bit, which it was supposed to do just before splashdown to help cushion the blow when it hit the water. But it wasn't supposed to happen in space. If it happens in space, then there's no protection as it comes back through the heat of, of the atmosphere on the way back down. It would incinerate in seconds. And so if that warning light was correct and they couldn't be sure, then, then there was no way Glenn was coming back alive. At least that was what they thought. And so a fierce debate, and I do mean fierce, uh, begins in mission control. And the last two of Glenn's three orbits are consumed with this discussion in mission control about whether to trust the signal and if the signal was right, whether anything could be done to save Glenn's life. But here's what they didn't do. They didn't tell Glenn a thing. They didn't say a word to John Glenn. Because Chris Kraft, who, as I mentioned before, was the flight director, he said, if we tell Glenn it's gonna he's going to panic, it's going to distract him, let's figure this out on our own. And so they begin instead to ask Glenn leading questions. At one point, they actually ask him, um, John, do you, do you hear any banging noises? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine being asked that question if you're in space? Yeah. Um, you're more than 100 miles above the Earth's surface. Do you hear any banging noises? No, I don't hear any banging noises. Later, they say, do you hear a flapping sound, anything like that, John? No, no, I don't. Um, and so it goes on like this for a while. They're just trying to see if they can work around to get the information they need without telling them what's going on. But of course, Glenn knows that these are not the sort of questions you should be asked. So he's aware something's going on. And over time, he starts to piece this together. But it's maddening that they won't tell him what, what's happening. So they, they come up with a solution that might not work, which is that they're at the bottom of the heat shield are, are three little jets called the retro pack, and they're strapped to the heat shield. And just before re-entry, that's supposed to be jettisoned. And then the heat shield can do its work. Well, they say, well, John, why don't you leave that attached? Nobody's ever talked about doing anything like this before. It's a huge deviation from the mission plan. And so Glenn says, and this is a really chilling moment in the, in the, trans, in, in the recording. He says, what is the reason for this? Do you have a reason? And there's silence and you hear the crackling on the line and they say, not at this time, not at this time. So even as he's about to plunge into the atmosphere into what one of the engineers says is sure death, they will not tell him what they think is going on. Uh, but we know um, from the, the, the vantage point of, uh, of 60 years later that he does get back safely. Um, and when he does, he has uh, some words with Chris Kraft and the <laughs> others who kept him in the dark. Yeah. That's remarkable. So he he does return successfully. And what's the reaction of the U.S. and the world? The reaction is um, is is wild. It's explosive. It's a kind of a catharsis. It's not just a celebration, but it's a kind of release of, of emotion that's been building up in many ways, not just for four months while this flight has been delayed, but but since 1957. I mean, almost you know, four and a half years by this point since Sputnik went up. And the sense that the United States had been outmatched in this dangerous new arena of, of space. And this was a sense that we, we, were, we were in it really for the first time, not even back in it. The United States hadn't really been in the space race in any meaningful uh, way until this moment. So 
there was a sense of relief and release, not just in the United States, but but across the, the free world. There were celebrations in London. There were celebrations in West Berlin. The world really stopped and watched this flight. I mean, it's it's very difficult in our fragmented world to, to, to imagine an event like this where everything just sort of stops. And even outside of um, a television range, people are listening on shortwave radios. To what is going to happen to John Glenn? Our allies are listening. Our adversaries are, are, are listening. And so it, it, was, um, it was absolutely tremendous. And, um, and, and, and this went on really for weeks. Uh, uh, there was a parade in Washington. There was a celebration in Cape Canaveral. There was one thing after another. But um, a couple of weeks passed before a celebration in New York. So keep in mind, this is a couple of weeks later. And in New York, four million people came out in the freezing cold into the streets to cheer John Glenn's motorcade, the biggest celebration since the end of World War II. People were standing and weeping in the streets. People were climbing bridges just to say that they were able to see the motorcade as it passed through. It was really like nothing else in the space race. And, and there would be nothing else like it really until Apollo 11. Yeah, that's, that's remarkable. So we have time, we have some audience questions coming in. Um, so maybe we'll start with uh, Tom's question. So Tom asks, are you familiar with the TV series For All Mankind, which offers an alternate history of the space race? If so, how well does it capture the dynamics of that era? I, I am familiar with it. I've, uh, I've binged it. <laughs> I'll probably <laughs> binge it again. I thought it was terrific. Um, yeah. And what I really liked about it is that it really, it, it really understands that this is a Cold War conflict, as I've been describing. If you imagine, as that series does, that the Soviets beat the U.S. to the moon, and then imagine what the response would be in the United States with Nixon in office, that we move very quickly in that series toward the militarization of space in a way that we, we didn't in reality. And, and I think for me, again, one of the reasons that I, I decided to re write this book, I, I talked about one of my other reasons earlier, but um, I felt that I had a shelf of books about space and I had a shelf of books about the Cold War. And they really seem to operate on, on different timelines, almost as if they were separate realities. They acknowledge each other, but they, they don't ever seem in most of these, these accounts as part of the same story. And so really what I'm trying to do here and what I think the series does is to, to bring them together into the, into the same frame. That was certainly how they were understood at, this, at that time. That makes sense. So our next question we have is from Jim. Jim asks, Jeff, any thoughts on how the US space program would have developed were it not for the launch of Sputnik and Gagarin? It's a, it's a great question. I, I think in both of those cases, both Sputnik and Vostok, which was the, the capsule that carried Gagarin into space, they were accelerants. I think by the time of Gagarin, if Gagarin hadn't gone into space, Alan Shepard would have flown his suborbital flight right around the, the same time. Uh, Gagarin's flight didn't really affect the timetable of the US space program very much because it was it already had a certain momentum. Shepard had already been assigned the flight. It was clear it was gonna be a suborbital flight. It was it was going to happen um, essentially on that, that timetable. Um, but but Sputnik really is is what uh, awoke the United States to, to the challenge. And and absent Sputnik, uh, I, I think we would have fallen farther and, and farther behind the, the pace that, that we were able to pick up after that. It was really only because of Sputnik and the political pressure um, that was then placed on Eisenhower by individuals like Lyndon Johnson and others that he reluctantly agreed to create NASA in 1958 and to move. I talked earlier about the different space programs within the military branches. Eisenhower moved all man in space. Again, that was the terminology, all man in space programs into this new agency, NASA. He wasn't particularly fond of the idea, but he felt by that point that he didn't really have much of a choice. So absent Sputnik, I think we would have been much slower um, to do anything like that. And perhaps we wouldn't have done it at all. So our next question is from Stephen. Stephen asks, what historical aspect of this era do you find most misrepresented in modern retellings? I.e. most dramatizations show Congress as an extension of public opinion rather than a source of substantive debate. Uh, it's, it's a great question and I'm glad you brought Congress into it because I think that's a big part of this. I think that one of the biggest misconceptions of this era is um, our, our understanding of John Kennedy in this moment. 
we remember the bold challenge that he issued to the United States to send uh, Americans to the moon by the end of the decade and bring them safely back to Earth. And he, he did issue that challenge, and it was bold. And yet, I think what we don't tend to recognize is how reluctant he was to make that commitment. We talked to, about that that earlier. And that Kennedy was a, something of a, a skeptic even after that moment, a skeptic of, of his own approach. He thought it was going to be colossally I expensive. Um, and it, he was never quite sure that it was worth the money. He was never quite sure that it was worth redirecting all of these scientific resources, all of this personnel and all of this energy to try to do that as opposed to doing other things. It's, it's sort of funny. No one will ever remember John Kennedy for this. But one of the things that he seemed sort of obsessed with, if you go back and, and read his, his remarks, was the desalinization of ocean water. This was his his this was his moonshot. <laughs> this uh, was was the, the idea of of providing a, a, a vast source of, of fresh water for people around the world. Um, that's what he would have liked to do with the money. But he understood the again the the Cold War imperative of investing all of this uh, in in space. Uh, and so um, he was reluctant, but went ahead. Congress was reluctant, but went ahead. And the opinion polls speaking of opinion polls, show that the American public wasn't particularly sold on the idea either. Uh, opinion polls, both before and after Kennedy's speech, show a, a pretty pretty low measure of public support for the idea of going to the moon. That makes sense. <clears throat> so our next question is from Eric, who asks, what sort of things did NASA learn and improve upon, both from an engineering and organizational perspective, after handling the potential heat shield issue? Well, the, the, the problem turned out to be the faulty wiring of a switch. Um, right. So that problem was relatively easy to fix. Right. Um, but there was a related issue, uh, and it was the one that Glenn raised when he got back to Earth, which is that the astronaut uh, can't be kept in the dark, that the astronaut, um, mm -hmm. you've chosen these individuals precisely because they don't panic in dangerous situations. If they were the kind of people who panic, they never would have been successful uh, test pilots, they wouldn't be alive by this point um, if they if they panicked in in the face of danger. And so the astronauts were were brought increasingly over time, not instantly. It didn't all happen right after Glenn's flight, but they are are brought increasingly into the discussion um, and given greater and greater agency. In part because the the missions become much more complex, and you could imagine that you might send the capsule around the earth a few times on autopilot. They had actually done that without a human being in the capsule. Um, but you couldn't, you couldn't um, send uh, th three uh, people to the moon and then land two of them and then get two of them back off it and all three of them home, uh, running the entire thing from the ground, running the entire thing on autopilot. So the astronauts needed to have a greater and greater role. And that was, uh, it was really Glenn's flight that, that brought this home for many, not for everybody. Not for Chris Kraft. He was more of a reluctant. Uh, uh, he he t he took some more persuading on this point. Right. Yeah. So so as we start to wrap up, we have time probably for one more question, and we have a question from Roberto who asks, "What do you think will be the effect of space tourism on the development of both government-funded space programs and private enterprises?" Well, one thing that's happening right now, I mean, it, just with the advent of space tourism is an in incredible uh, wave of, of excitement and focus on on space. Uh, and um, it's it's thrilling, actually, to see. I mean, even putting aside the fact that it's um, uh, you're betting on three three billionaires here, it is pretty exciting to see what their companies have been able to create technologically. And the fact that they're able to do this, this safely um, does feel like we are entering a new era and a new kind of race to see who's able to build that first. Um, at the same time, I wonder if it is, um, and this is an open question, um, uh, whether this will uh, redirect our focus a little to the other, maybe more consequential space race that, that's happening right now, which is the one between the United States and, and China. China has made no secret of its ambitions in space, uh, as I'm sure everyone I uh, here saw that right on the heels of our lander on Mars, they put their own lander on Mars, unfurled the Chinese flag and sent these uh, selfies uh, back to Earth. Um, China has very ambitious plans. They're building a space station right now. They have three of their astronauts up there, as many of us saw a couple of weeks ago, they sent them up. And, um, and big plans on the moon. 
And uh, not just this sort of sensational stuff that seems focused on exploration, but actually around the Earth, in orbit around the Earth, uh, there is a, a fierce competition going on um, uh, in terms of uh, which nation is most proficient um, in, in, uh, in, in knocking the other, in knocking other nations' uh, satellites uh, out by one means or another, disabling them or destroying them. And both Russia and China have invested very heavily in what are called counter space capabilities. In the United States, while we have our own counter space capabilities, um, is playing catch up a little bit. So there's a lot of attention focused on these men we know, and they are, of course, all men right now, Musk, Bezos, Branson, and whose company is going to dominate this, this new industry that's being created. But actually, in terms of uh, life here on Earth and the consequences of what happens in space, uh, the other space race may be more important. And are we being distracted from that? Or is our is our perspective broadening enough to be able to take all of this in? It's an open question, as I said. Yeah. Yeah, well, Jeff, uh, we're just about out of time. And I want to thank you so much again for being with us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. Well, thanks so much, Matt. It's been great talking with you. And thanks to everyone for your questions and for taking time out of your day to watch and listen. Yeah, so, so Jeff's book, Mercury Rising, is available now wherever books are sold, including through your local and independent bookseller. Uh, for everyone who joined us today, we look forward to seeing you at our next Toxic Google event. Please stay safe and take care.